see the ears and the tail are different. And the new one. And by the way, you may uh, be able to purchase it by the university. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Excellent. Well, thank you to uh, be here. Welcome to my lecture on uh, promises and perils of AI. Yeah. So, um, the goal today is to give you a glimpse of what is AI and what are the achievements we did so far and uh, link it to also applications in medicine since we are in the department of uh, medicine. The fact of medicine and dentistry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll start actually with an example to motivate this whole thing. An example in medicine. Um, I'll start with the Ebola virus. So you know about the Ebola virus. It's a virus, a uh, terrible virus. This uh, disease is actually not curable and it can kill. And very fast, it spreads very fast. So in 2014, there was an outbreak, a very serious outbreak in West Africa. And uh, for a long time, they had no idea it was the Ebola virus. They thought it was cholera because actually where uh, people were sick, they found bacteria. So they didn't even think about the virus. Um, <clears throat> but very quickly, it spread in many, many, many countries. So Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Nigeria, Mali, and Senegal but also in the United States and Italy, United Kingdom, and Spain. So it became a global issue. That's when people started thinking, oh my gosh, this is serious. Because when it happens in Africa, they don't care. <clears throat> uh, it's only a few months later after it started that the uh, World Health Organization announced that it actually it is the Ebola virus. Um, <clears throat> so from 2013 till I think March 2014, they had no idea, and then from 2014 till 2016, they were fighting it. And during that time, 28,000 people got the virus. Almost half of them died. It's huge. Okay. So when there is a, an outbreak like this, one of the things they do, so this is the outbreak, that, as I said, it's mainly in Africa. Most of these outbreaks are in Africa. Um, <clears throat> well, often people think, oh, it's just in Africa, but uh, any place on earth becomes global very quickly because people travel. So this is from those regions where people travel, the United States and Europe and Asia and, and South of Africa and Middle East and, and so forth. So uh, any disease like that becomes serious because it can spread very, very, very quickly. <clears throat> So anyways, when, when uh, something like that happens, the first thing they want to do is uh, try to understand how it started. Why? So that you can prevent other, other cases like that. So they want to find patient zero, the first patient that got sick and passed it to others. Um, so they use different techniques to do this and took months and months and months. Uh, they used uh, techniques that also were related to uh, machine learning called social network analysis. And they went back up to the original, um, <clears throat> so the patient zero, it's a toddler, two years old. Um, but by then, of course, the, the, the child was dead. But they went to the, the house where the child was living and the, the, the playground where, where the child was playing to understand what was going on. But by then, the whole village was dead and they burned the house. And, there was a tree, uh, a tree next to the house in the playground where the, the child was playing, uh, and that tree had uh, that tree housed bats. So it's known that bats, certain bats, the the uh, well, I'll get to that. So the bats that um, eat fruit are Ebola virus reservoir. It means that they can have the the virus, but they don't get sick from it, and then they spread it. <clears throat> um, but they looked at that tree where the bats lived. The bats were gone by then because it was it was burnt. Um, were not 
fruit-eating bats. There were all kinds of bats, so they were really, really surprised. So what they did, they, they were actually uh, insect-eating bats. So they did an analysis. They used machine learning to build models uh, that could predict whether an animal is Ebola virus reservoir or not. Um, so they took about, well, they took a few uh, uh, a thousand cases of bats, <coughs> And they looked at their biological characteristics. So they took about uh, 60 different variables uh, from different species of these, uh, these bats. And they built what we call a decision tree. Okay? If you have this characteristic, then you have, you have this, we have that. Yeah. So they built this decision tree. And they used that model to do prediction. And it wasn't that perfect. They adjusted it again, they adjusted it again. They did many different trees. And then finally, uh, by retraining and retraining, they got something that reached about 87% accuracy. So here, given an animal with these characteristics, whether it is Ebola virus uh, 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 reservoir or not, potentially, and they have an accuracy of 87%. So using that information, they looked at the map in the world. So this is the, it's a heat map. Where are the bats that are known to be problematic? With the Ebola virus. So these are uh, filovirus positive bats. And you can see that the majority that are known are in Africa. And that explains why we have many epidemics there. Some of them are in Asia and Europe, and so they're spread like that. Then when they mapped the new ones that they have discovered thanks to the model that they built, then you can see that um, they're spread in other places. And the, the hotspot is actually like Laos, Cambodia, and uh, in Thailand, it's a different hotspot than the one that, uh, that we know. And this is interesting because that actually creates a new hypothesis. How come the <coughs> outbreaks are mainly in Africa and not in these parts of the world, despite the fact that this part of the world, they have actually way more uh, fetal virus uh, positive bat species. So machine learning was used to do this analysis and actually uh, come up with new hypotheses. Um, another use of, uh, in this particular case, another use of machine learning um, is in pharmacology. So, as I said, the Ebola virus is not something that we can treat. We don't have any drugs for that. But, of course, uh, the companies are, are working on it. And there are some uh, ingredients that are found to be anti-Ebola virus activity in vitro. Um, so they have to look at other uh, different molecules to try, but there are millions of these commercially available. Which ones should they try? It's too many. It'll take them uh, a lifetime to try uh, some of these. So they need to have a way to prioritize some of these com uh, compounds to work on and ignore the rest. And again, machine learning came to the rescue. Uh, because they use machine learning to build um, uh, predictive models based on what is known, and that was used to rank these uh, millions of these uh, molecules, and they took the top ones and they tried them, and the top ones discovered by machine learning were actually uh, very promising. So these are two examples to show you how machine learning can be extremely useful and medical research. I didn't say what is machine learning. You have no idea what it is. So that's what I will be telling you about during this lecture. So machine learning is part of AI. It's a subfield within artificial intelligence where we are trying to teach a machine some model. So the machine learns by itself. We'll get to that. Okay. So what is AI? What is machine learning? Why is it coming now? Why everybody's talking about AI and machine learning today? And then I will show you some examples in precision health, how this can be used to, uh, to improve medicine, particularly precision health. So this is uh, basically medicine that is catered to individuals rather than the same treatment for everybody. One shoe fits all. So, <clears throat> Artificial intelligence, even though you started hearing about it recently, is uh, fairly old. 
is as old as the modern computers. The field started in the 50s, right after the Second World War. We had these computers that were used for deciphering code, uh, machines that were used to calculate trajectories of missiles and things like that. Then after the Second World War, people were thinking, what can we do with these machines that we can program? There's a bunch of people who met together in 1956, and uh, they created this big conference where they started thinking about how can we make the machine think like us, the humans. And they believed it's possible. They called the field artificial intelligence. This is our intelligence that is artificial. Uh, <clears throat> they believe that if you take any intelligent activity that we humans do, you break it down into pieces, and if you program every single piece, then you can create a machine that thinks like humans. They sincerely believed it, and they worked on it for a while, and to demonstrate how it works, they focused on games that normally require some form of intelligence. So there's a consensus that, well, if you're a champion in chess, you must be intelligent. Okay? Because defining what is intelligence is tough, too. So most of the activity was around uh, solving games like chess, backgammon, checkers, and things like that. But very quickly, um, that hyper-optimism that people had uh, well, which the disillusionment, people realized, well, this is utopia. We will not be able to um, build a machine that is intelligent like humans. We can do it. <clears throat> so they were disappointed because there was a high expectation and suddenly nothing. Um, it's only um, in the 80s, around the 80s, where a subfield of AI show incredible promise. This is a subfield called machine learning. We're trying to make the machine learn uh, a particular task by itself. Um, here I'm representing an example where the machine decides whether an email should become spam and dump it in the garbage or stay in your mailbox. Um, <clears throat> so um, this brought back uh, a lot of hope. Uh, and many applications became uh, very successful. But still not as successful as what you see today. So what happened is that in around 2012, a subfield of machine learning called deep learning. Have you heard of deep learning? Okay, some of you are nodding, yes, yes. So deep learning is a subfield of machine learning that uses very old technology from the 50s called neural networks, okay? um, but it, it's, well, they rebranded as deep learning because now, and I'll get to that later, the machines are able to manage very large networks that we didn't do before. They, were, they didn't have the machines in the past, they didn't have the machines to really push the limit of, of neural networks. So they didn't know the, the capabilities. Today we have those machines and we can push the, the uh, neural networks to incredible limits um, and we have incredible results to the point that today uh, a deep learning based algorithm can do better than uh, a dermatologist to recognize, for example, melanoma or better than a radiologist to identify breast cancer or things like that and by a long shot. And that's why people are scared and people think, oh my gosh, we will be replaced by, by computers. Um, rest assured, we're not there yet. I'll, I'll show you examples. So what you have to retain from here is that deep learning is a kind of machine learning, and machine learning is a subfield within AI. They're not equal. Many people using the synonyms, they're not. Um, <clears throat> So what you see, what I'm, I'm going to show you that in a different uh, uh, picture. You have the field of computer science. Within the field of computer science, there is a subfield called artificial intelligence. Like any other subfield within computer science, like uh, networking, high performance computing, software engineering, graphics, databases, algorithms, human computer interaction, these are many subfields in computing science. 
And one of them is AI. I didn't, I didn't make it big because it's the most important one. No, no, it's because I'm going to zoom in. Okay, so there are many as important as uh, well, AI is as important as the other fields. Within AI, we have a sub subfield called machine learning, as I told you before, and it's equal to other subfields like planning, knowledge representation, how to do reasoning, computer vision, natural language processing. These are all within AI. So machine learning is one of them. And again, machine learning is not the most important one. Uh, well, today it is. But I'm making it big because I'm going to zoom in. So within machine learning, you have something called supervised learning. Uh, and you also have unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and others, and so forth. Different paradigms. And within supervised learning, so supervised means I'm actually and we'll get to the details in another lecture. But supervised means I'm helping it. I'm helping it by providing examples. Uh, so within the supervised learning, there's deep learning. There are other, other uh, techniques like, as well, like uh, support vector machines, like Bayesian classifiers, like associative classifiers, and so forth. <coughs> Decision trees. So deep learning is within supervised learning, which is within machine learning, which is part of AI, which is a field of is that clear as a picture? Good. So, what is this AI? So, people are saying, well, AI market will be worth um, almost $60 billion by 2025. So, it must be very important. I mean, everybody heard of AI, so it must be important. Everybody's talking about AI. Even somebody quite famous said, the one who dominates AI will rule the world. Do you know who said that? Any guesses? Vladimir Putin. So politicians now realize the importance of AI. It's huge. And that's why China, for example, is investing billions of dollars in AI. It's huge. And they promise to be leading the advancement of AI by 2030. And I believe them. Many people don't, but I believe them because I know what's going on. Yeah. So our definitions of AI, we, the people who don't know anything, come from magazines, from newspapers, and uh, like Dr. Solis was talking about Blade Runner and, and the movie AI. That's where we get our definitions, from movies. Unfortunately, movies don't portray the reality. They, they have these sensational fiction scenarios. <clears throat> they portray an unrealistic picture. And often, it's very pessimistic, like doomsday. And, uh, them, them, the machines, against us. They will kill us all. Uh, and that's exaggerated. Of course, it's... It's cool for a movie, uh, but no, it's not the reality. And, and what's uncool is that people end up believing in it. Okay. Um, and that's why people are talking about existential threat and things like that. But, well, should we dismiss it completely? I wouldn't. Um, because we have to stop thinking about it as well as a threat so that we do the ethical thing, we do the right thing. It was, uh, we may go on a different path that could be dangerous indeed. <clears throat> but being an alarmist is not healthy. The AI today is what you have in your pocket. Those smartphones have the AI of today. Okay. And you have an idea. Are you, are you afraid of your phone? Apart from the fact that it takes a lot of your time? Steals the time from you? Yeah, but it, it's not threatening, is it? That's the AI today. But it's changing quickly. Right. So um, how do uh, scientists define AI? It's not from the movies. So here's uh, a definition by Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky was in the uh, conference in, in 1956. So he was uh, one of the pioneers in AI. Uh, and he actually f uh, uh, founded the first uh, AI research lab, the uh, AI lab at uh, MIT. He was the director of that lab for a long time. Uh, 
um, he passed away recently. He said, artificial intelligence is the science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by, done by human. Um, doesn't mean that they are intelligence, but they do things uh, that normally we think they would require intelligence. Mind you, uh, this is, definition is still very vague. Do you know that uh, one of the first um, word processors came out in the late 70s? People thought it was AI. Why? Well, do you remember how people were typing with a typewriter? And now they ask you, we want, to, we want to justify the paragraph. Try to justify the paragraph with a typewriter. You have to count how many letters. I want it on 80 characters, so I have this. So I do the, the subtraction, and I have to add spaces in between words before I type them, because once I type them, it's finished. Okay? So you needed to think about it. Now suddenly the word processor, boom, does it automatically. That was amazing. People were flabbergasted by that. And it checks the spelling, and suggests things. It was a, a huge shift. Who thinks today that your word processor is AI? Nobody. Nobody. So the definition of what is AI is a moving target that changes with time. Once it's a common thing and everybody thinks it's trivial, it's not AI anymore. So who knows what, uh, what we will consider AI tomorrow. Um, here's a the common definition, artificial intelligence is a discipline, so it's like a, a science. It's a discipline striving to get machines behave intelligently by performing tasks that would normally require human intelligence. For me, personally, um, and involved in AI, and I swim in it, for me, um, artificial intelligence is just an enhancement of our creativity. For me, it's a tool that we build in order to do something that we wouldn't be able to do without that tool. For example, I don't know, I have nails. I'm trying to push the nail in, in the wood. I can't. I will break my thumb. So I'll invent a hammer, and I can hammer that nail very easily, way better than my thumb. It doesn't mean that that hammer is replacing me. Okay? It's an extension of me. Make sense? So there are things that I can already do. I could have taken a stone and hit that thing. I can't already do it, but the hammer does it better. So I will build a tool to do things that I already do but better, or things that I can't do, and now I can do them with a new tool. You'll see examples. Um, there's, an, there's another term that is, has been used for a while before uh, AI came back to the surface. It's called data mining. Do you know what data mining is? Have you heard of data mining? Yes, everybody. So I want to define what data mining is. Data mining is a process of discovering and extracting patterns potentially useful uh, and unknown to me okay, from large collections of data. And actually machine learning is part of data mining because what machine learning will do, I'll, remember I said it's supervised, so I'll give it data, it will look through that data and look for patterns and it will use these patterns to build that predictive model. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's the analysis and, and, and interpretation of the intelligent interpretation of large data in order to provide actionable knowledge from this data for human decision support uh, or sometimes automatic algorithms as well. And data mining is at the confluence of many different fields. So you have database systems, artificial intelligence is one of them, you have visualization, information retrieval, high performance computing, statistics, and many other fields as well. So machine learning is, is somewhere there. So why is it that AI is coming back now? Coming back because I said it existed since the 50s. Actually AI went through two winters. We call them the winters of AI. 
in the uh, late 70s, so 1976, so 20 years after people started talking with AI. Um, there's a famous uh, researcher, uh, Dr. Dreyfus, who wrote an article saying that this whole thing is utopia, and then suddenly people say, yeah, yeah, he's right, and they stop the funding of AI. So the politician said, it's, that's enough, we gave them money for 20 years and they didn't do what they promised to do, so we'll use the money somewhere else. The funding dried out, and that's why we call it the winter of AI. And then in the 80s, uh, I don't have the exact date, but anyways, so there's a resurgence of AI thanks to uh, a subfield called expert systems, because the market for expert systems grew to $4 billion or something. Um, and also, there was um, a new project happening in Japan called the fifth generation uh, computers. And they started building computers based on uh, Prolog and Lisp. Uh, and people said, oh, the Japanese know something we don't know. Maybe they will get to these intelligent machines. So funding came back. And there's a lot of uh, research. And then um, what happened, so this is in the in North America, in Europe, and in, in Asia as well, particularly Russia. We're talking here about the, the, the Cold War, so it, it was a race. <clears throat> the um, promise from the Japanese didn't go through. Um, there was a, a failure of the list machines, so the funding dried out again. And it's only recently that it's, it got out of the the big chasm again. Um, so why is it now? Why is it that now it's amazingly popular and everybody, everybody's talking about AI to the point that they're afraid of it? Well, there are three factors, three main factors. First one is the fact that we have more data than ever before. We collect everything. I mean, just think about your cell phone, how much data you collect with. You take pictures, you send messages, now, thinking about a hospital, how much data we are collecting, medical pictures of the MRIs, the, the, uh, um, all sorts of data we collect. Um, <clears throat> collect data on the web, the activities that you do on the web, um, the uh, um, buying things, searching things, uh, uh, browsing things, it's a lot of data. The uh, second factor is the fact that computers today are incredibly fast uh, compared to yesterday. And the third factor is that now we have sophisticated algorithms that we didn't have before. So put these together and uh, that justifies why, uh, uh, why AI today. So where's the data coming from? Um, just giving some examples. This is activity on the web. The stuff on Netflix, on YouTube, on Google, Facebook, the social media stuff. It's mind-boggling how much data is generated from the activities that are happening online. This is just the web. You know, as I said, if you take a hospital or a company or whatever, they have their own data, it's growing at an incredible pace. Um, if I take the example, oh, these are examples of data. Um, yeah, so the Internet of Things, so now with um, <coughs> the new protocols for the Internet, uh, IP version 6, um, the address of objects online has changed, and the address allows you to put now billions of different objects. So many things can be connected to the Internet today, billions of things. So people have wearables, the light bulb, the camera, uh, whatever. All these are interconnected, and they generate a lot of data. Electronic medical record, insurance providers, clinical trials, uh, genome data, social media, and so forth. So the, there are many examples of why we, we are collecting data. So I think I have examples here just to illustrate in, in, a, in a tangible way uh, how much data we are collecting. So there are people who actually vote papers to try to estimate the amount of data that is collected. This was. Um, this is data in general. So this paper was written in 2011 on data uh, from 2007. 
And they said that if we put all the data that we were collecting on CDs, at that time they had CDs. Remember the CDs? So if we put the, all the data we have in CDs and we stack them one on top of the other, we'll reach the moon. That's huge. Well, that's not impressive anymore, because there's another paper that said, that came later, um, that said, okay, we'll focus just on medical data in the United States only. And so they calculated it, and they said, oh, no, I'm going to put them in CDs. CDs, that's yesterday. We'll put them on DVDs. Remember the DVDs? It's also yesterday. At that time, it was DVDs. So they put them on DVDs. And they realize, actually, if you stack them one on top of the other, we will go to the moon twice. So this shows you the growth. It's phenomenal. Okay. Um, another example to show you how important this, uh, uh, the amount of data, uh, you look at the capacity that we have on our storage devices. So if you took a, take a look at the micro SD cards, in 2005, they were reaching 128 megs. So you can put it on your your cameras. Nobody has a camera nowadays, you, know, you use a cell phone. But, uh, 2005 or 2014, they became 128 gigabytes, not megabytes. Gigabytes. Nobody talks about megabytes anymore. Okay. 2016, two years later, doubled 256 gigabytes. 2018, doubled again, 512 gigabytes. So they went from 128 megabytes to 512 gigabytes. 4,000 time improvements in 13 years. 4,000 times on the same space, the same car. Actually, 2019 we reached one terabyte. So it's 8,000 time improvement in 14 years. So one year we doubled. Who knows what? 2020 reserves for us. Okay. Price. This will uh, shock you. This is a picture taken in 1956, the birth date of artificial intelligence. Panam is moving a hard drive from IBM to a company that is purchasing that hard drive. How big was that hard drive? Five megs the size of one nice big picture today, okay? The cost was $120,000. It was so important that even the captain of the plane was there for the photo of it. Yeah, it was a big deal. $120,000. Today, you can go on a website online, I'll name it, and you can buy a 64 gigabyte for less than $20. Actually, this is an old picture. Um, <clears throat> so that means that if I took this back in time to 1956, it will cost me a billion dollars. That SD card, a billion dollars. It's very difficult to imagine. Okay? So that's the progress we did. Okay? Improvement of 76 million times, of course, in half a century, but still. In terms of, uh, so that's, that's for the, the data. What about improvement? I'll give you examples also to show you how mind-boggling improvement has been. Um, the deep learning that I was telling you about, we run them on GPUs. Do you know what a GPU is? GPU is a graphic card, so this is a graphical processing unit, that you buy to put on your computer at home to play games. Okay, because games require more power than just the normal CPU that you have on your computer. And you can buy a very sophisticated GPU today for a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars, you get an amazing GPU. GPUs are about two hundred dollars, but the, the powerful ones that we use now for deep learning, um, because we don't use them for, for playing games, we use them for sophisticated computations, they're about $1,000. It's not huge. Well, that GPU that I can buy for 1000 bucks from a store here in Edmonton, anywhere, is equivalent to the Cray-1 that was 
millions of dollars and only few countries were allowed to have it. Now anybody can go and buy a GPU put it on their computer at home. So people are having collecting statistics about the most powerful computer every single year. So this started in 1993 and every year I have it from the, until last year. So every year they say here's the most powerful computer uh, here and uh, looks like the green is, this is the sum of the uh, 10 top and this is the, so forget the blue and the green, just focus on the uh, golden triangle. This is the fastest computer every single year, okay? In terms of what? In terms of how many millions of uh, 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 floating point operations they can do in one second. Okay, in one second, how many operations can you do? Okay, and this is a logarithmic scale, okay. and this is time. And you can see that it's going steadily up. Okay? And remember, again, it's logarithmic scale. So it's multiplied again and again, every single line going up. So a few years ago, there were the Chinese who had the fastest computer uh, in the world. And then only in 2018, so last year, finally, IBM built another machine that uh, beats the Chinese. So we're very happy. The interesting thing is that this machine, um, the IBM Summit, is just a collection of these graphics cards that put them all together. A collection of GPUs, but how to connect them together was the trick, and uh, they have now the fastest machine in the world. Your phones. These are the fastest phones today in the market. They have a Huawei Mate 20 Pro and the Apple iPhone XS. Where do they fit in here? Okay. And you have them in your pocket. Well, they fit here. The fastest, they, they reach about one teraflop. Okay? So that is equivalent to the fastest machine in 1997, at the end of 1997. This is the machine that reached the one, the first machine that passed the one teraflop. It was $55 million at the time. It was equivalent to a tennis court was huge, okay? and it used enough power to, to, uh, 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 to power 800 houses, just a small town. Okay? Now you have them in your pocket. So that's the, uh, that's the machine, the ASCII red, and where's my phone on the desk? Well, I'll put it there, that's my phone. Those are equivalent. That gives you an idea what's the progress we made in a few years. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip all this. Um, yeah, so the progress between this machine in 1993 and this fastest machine, so just this, you think it's not much, but uh, again, this is logarithmic. Uh, it's uh, 200,000 times faster, yeah, 206,000 times faster in 25 years. 200, and I repeat it, 206,000 times faster. It's phenomenal. So the things that we failed to do here, it's because we didn't have all that power. Now we have it. And also we have almost free memory. It's very cheap. We're not paying a billion dollars. We're paying $28 for a lot of memory. Okay, So you can store all that data, and you have the power to crunch it. Okay. So... <clears throat> To better understand, what is that 26,000 times? This is when I was doing my PhD. If I was doing the same progress as these machines, and now I'm 206,000 times better than when I started my PhD, it means when I do a step here, it's one, one meter, today, 25 years later, I 25 to 206,000 times one meter was that. 206 kilometers. So that means when I used to do a step 25 years ago, now my step will take me to almost Calgary. Okay, one step take me anywhere in that circle. That's the progress we did. Okay? It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, the progress we did in terms of space in the same, well, capacity in the same space is like. Um, I'm in, in, in Banff and I can 
step outside Banfield in one shot. Or I'm here and I'll be in, in I don't know, almost uh, at the edge of the city. Okay. What about that same analogy, but in terms of price, 76 million times. So one meter becomes, 70, becomes 76 million meters. That's going around the world more than twice. That's the progress we did. Imagine the humans can now step around the world twice. That's what computers did. Okay. Yeah. What about improvement in, in algorithms? Well, you can definitely understand how they're linked because the algorithm that we used to have, um, even if we imagined them theoretically, we couldn't run them here or we didn't have enough data. So deep learning is the result of that. Uh, so what is this deep learning? So deep learning is, as I said before, it's based on a technology that was proposed in the 50s called neural networks, called artificial neural networks. They tried to think about how the, the brain functions. Still don't understand that, but it's a close analogy to how the brain functions. You have neurons, and these neurons communicate with each other. So the information comes from the dendrites, they're processed somehow in the cell, and then a message is sent through the axon, and it excites other dendrites on the other side. So they put these artificial neurons, which is an artificial neuron, it's a, a cell here that receives messages, you know, like the dendrites. The dendrites have different strengths, so messages don't come with the same weight. So you have different weights. It's like a vector of weights coming in. And then the cell here at one point is activated and sends a message along the axon. And it may be received by another cell. So you have them as layers. And this is what you have here we call a, a neural network. You have a layer of input data. You have a layer at the end that sends you, and gives you the message, the final, final say. And then you have what we call hidden layers. But the technology is so sophisticated that the old machines were not able to handle that many neurons. We have 100 billion of them in our brain. So they typically had only one hidden layer and as enough neurons to code the input and enough neurons in the output here to code the result that you want. Et voila, that's the neural network you have. So they were not good enough to do the prediction that we want today. Um, today, because we have these computers and this amazing uh, uh, infrastructure, you can have sophisticated neural networks where you have many hidden layers. So this is deep. It's one of the reasons why we coined it as deep learning, because you have many layers. And with the new machines and all the data that we have, they try different architectures. These are so what we call uh, deep neural networks. They fully connected. There's convolution neural network, recurrent neural network, uh, LSTMs, and so forth. I will not go into details, but they are all they're stemming from this idea. Okay. And the beauty of uh, oh something else I wanted to mention. This is the pride of Canada. Those who continue to work on this technology, who believed in it. When everybody else said, eh, it doesn't work, and they start focusing on something else. And they demonstrated that actually it works today. Our two, uh, we call them now the pioneers of deep learning, uh, two researchers uh, in Canada, Joshua Benji of the University of Montreal, and Jeff Hinton of the University of Toronto. So um, Canada has been instrumental in this uh, success of AI in the world. Of course, there are other ones, uh, like Jan Lecun, he's the head of uh, AI at Facebook. He was a postdoc of Jeff Hinton. We have uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber in, in uh, Switzerland, who did the LSTM idea. But mainly, it, it came out of Canada. Um, so what happened? How did the rest of the world hear about this thing called deep learning? There's a competition. The competition has been running for now um, many years, um, <clears throat> for, for 10 years, 20 years, um, 10 years now. 
um, there are, there's a collection of images, huge collection of images. And the goal is to recognize what's in that image. So how do you do it automatically? There are images with plants, with animals, with devices, food, structure, like buildings, people. And you want a program that can recognize them automatically. I mean, humans also participate in this uh, test. And well, they don't do 100%. They make errors, too. So here you have the competitors. This is the winner in 2009, the winner in 2010, winner of 2011. And you can see every year they do better. They build new models with statistics and stuff like that to do the prediction. This is where the human is, typical human. Uh, the accuracy is about 90%. The expert human, who actually works with these uh, images all the time, they have 95% accuracy. Because the images are like pictures and you have occlusion, you have things on the other direction, and it, it's not easy. Okay? But the machines are way behind the humans. And then suddenly, in 2012, what happened? There's a huge jump. 